Hey everyone, McCain Vogel here at FIRA USA in Sacramento, California. Welcome to Conservation Ag Update. Conservation Ag Update is brought to you by Cultivase. Hey, welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in as always. Our harvest season odyssey continues in Amboy, Illinois, where I spent the day with Dave Thompson, a farmer turned precision specialist for Case IH dealer Johnson Tractor. And Dave says most of his customers are actually already done with harvest. They were done in the middle of October and they're pretty happy so far with the results. Beans, beans went fast this year. Guys were able to combine beans all day long rather than just, you know, maybe an afternoon because of the dew and yeah, no, what a, what a, what a nice year. Of course, they're not happy with market prices. I mean, that, that's not that uncommon. <laughs> Um, with the, where the markets are, they're not great. I'm well aware of that, but the yields are incredible. Uh, yeah, I, I've yet to talk to anybody that's not happy with their yields. Um, we had a, a fairly dry summer here. Um, so kind of, kind of surprising that, you know, the yields are there like they are. Let us know how harvest is going in your neck of the woods. Shoot me an email at innewman at lessermedia.com. How will those tough market prices that Dave mentioned affect your nutrient management plans for 2025? Well, University of Illinois soil scientist Andrew Marganot says you might want to think about dialing back those P and K rates if possible. This is a lot like the MRTN, the economic return to nitrogen. We think all the time about maximizing dollar per acre for our nitrogen. But we don't really do that for P and K. And it's good to think about, and this is for each person to decide clearly based on their system, whether the couple of bushels that we won't lose by applying P and K, again, depending on the soil test, is that worth it economically? And in some years like this one, if grain prices are low and prices of P are pretty high, it may be okay to lose a couple of yields by not adding P, sorry, a couple of bushels of yield. By, by not adding P, because the P wouldn't pay for that five bushel maintenance. So I would just suggest that to think about the economics of the P for this season. And catch my full conversation with Andrew about phosphorus applications and much more on the latest edition of the Strip Till Farmer podcast. All right, right now we're going to check in with McCain Vogel, who's out in California for the premier agrobotics conference. McCain. Thanks, Noah. McCain Vogel here. I am in Sacramento, California at FIRA USA, and we're going to get right into it. Why don't you take a look at some of the most exciting things I saw this year at the conference. iGen is a solar-powered autonomous weeding robotics company. We are a truly solar one with a solar panel on top charging the, uh, the robotics system, and it runs in a fleet format. So you deploy these robots on the field from the uh, emergence of the crop all the way to full canopy. And so the system drives through the fields with camera systems pointing down, identifies the weeds and the crops, and it removes them with a mechanical hose on the back. So we like to think of the Element Robot, which is what you're looking at here, as a terrestrial satellite rover. It has all the connectivity and data collection capability of a satellite out in space. That's part of that true solar. It's fully off-grid. It's totally autonomous. Um, but it's here on Earth, so it's roaming around. And um, what we, re we really wanted to focus on was delivering value to customers. So what we heard loud and clear from uh, all of the growers that we talked to, all the farmers we spoke to, was that data is great and insights are better, but none of that matters if you can't immediately turn that into action. So the robot is equipped to uh, identify crops, differentiate them from weeds, and then make a striking decision and eliminate the weed in real time. It's all edge compute. It's happening on board. Um, and so you have the data, but you have action. And that's kind of our internal tagline is data to action. Thank you very much for that report, McCain Vogel. Moving on, longtime Western Oklahoma no-tiller Jimmy Smith and his son Spencer keep their sandy soils in place by interseeding cereal rye into standing cotton. And they're using a Dalton Ag Mobility 600 fertilizer applicator to get the job done. Check it out. We used to always interseed our, our uh, cotton with these modified grain drills to go in between the rows. But years after years, seemed like the cotton varieties have progressed so much that we have better cotton and we were doing a lot of damage to our crop. So two years ago, we went to broadcasting rye, cereal rye you know, in our crop. We started with this machine right here. Really, it's just it's a fertilizer applicator, but it, it's tall enough that it won't do any damage to the cotton. 
So we've got it set on 40 inch uh, rows. That's what our, what our row spacing is. And it takes roughly 12 rows, which is the same as our plan. So uh, it's PTO driven, uh, we're on what, 540? Got some 540, and we run probably oh six, six to seven mile an hour with it. So we can cover a lot of ground. Plus, it holds a lot of seed. Where our grain drills that we had, you know, they they didn't hold maybe 30 bushels. So we were filling up all the time. Where this one here, we can cover a lot of acres. It's very efficient and very easy, and doesn't do any crop damage, which was the main thing. Their seeding rate is about 70 pounds per acre. Smith says the rye also helps with weed suppression. When we've got bare ground, we've got weeds, as he puts it. Video of the week now, we've got an exclusive interview with Ricky Brown, who developed the first ever commercial strip till rig with Leo and Gerald Hardin in Alabama. Our Mike Lesseter catches up with Brown for a look back at the groundbreaking creation. We built the very first one in 1972, and in 1980, then we revolutionized it or redesigned it totally. And the units, the, the strip tillage units today, are exactly like we were building in 1980. So the technology's been around a long time. It got a little too big for us, and in 1981, I think it was, we, we sold our patents to, to the Bush Hog Corporation. And then they called it a precision applied tillage, I think was the term that they used. And they were in it for a few years, and and it, for whatever reason, they abandoned it. And uh, but of course now it's about 80% of the cotton is grown strip tillage now in the whole U.S. So we, we were we were on the right track. We just we we just didn't last long enough. We didn't didn't pursue it hard enough. We were at least 20 years ahead of our time, and so that's that's the story of that, and that's the history. That's how it started by subsoiling on the backside of a field where you couldn't see it from the road, and then planting perpendicular to it. And, and the corn grew much better over the slots. Catch the full interview on the No-Till Farmer YouTube channel. And if you have any story ideas or comments, shoot me an email at innewman at lessermedia.com. Plus, don't forget to check out the No-Till Conference program at notillconference.com. 23 classrooms, 12 must attend general sessions, cavalcade of stars, January 7th through 10th in Louisville, Kentucky. Hope to see you there. Thanks for tuning in to Conservation Ag Update. I'm Noah Newman. Have a great day.